Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for this extremely generous introduction, which sets the uh, uh, expectations very high. Um, um, I hope I'll be able to deliver. Um, so I'm Ludmil, and what I, what I do work on uh, is mutation of signatures. And what I care about is what causes mutations, and what causes mutations in normal cells, and what causes mutations in cancer cells. And usually my talks are about environmental exposures, UV light, tobacco smoking, etc. But what I'm going to talk to you today are clock-like mutational processes or, or clock-like mutational signatures. So these are signatures that are constantly active in our cells, that are accumulating in our body just because we are alive. And I'm going to talk to you how they contribute towards the accumulation of mutations in normal somatic cells as well as into the somatic mosaicism in our body. Now, I'm going to start from, uh, with an overview. Somatic mutations occur in every single cell of our body. They constantly, uh, they accumulate uh, throughout our lifetime. And some of these mutations, as I said, happen just, just because we are alive. They happen because cells are dividing, and during the, the actual cellular division, there could be, for example, slippage of the replication fork that will result in accumulation of small insertions and deletions. Mutations can accumulate uh, just because the cell is active. The energy that's being generated in the cell for uh, uh, will cause things like reactive oxygen species, which will damage DNA and eventually lead to somatic mutations. Mutations can accumulate due to environmental exposure. So, for example, uh, sunbathing or being exposed to ultraviolet light is going to mutate every single cell of the skin. Mutations can accumulate due to lifestyle choices, so smoking tobacco cigarettes. Uh, is going to mutate every single cell of the lung of a smoker, and it is going to obviously increase the, can the risk for cancer, uh, lung cancer amongst many other cancer types. Uh, somatic mutations can accumulate unknowingly. So for example, ingesting uh, certain uh, substances in the food. So this is an example of aflatoxin. It's a type of mold. You could be eating it when you're consuming things like carrots, peanut butter. And again, this is going to mutate cells in your bladder, cells in your liver. And there's many, many such examples of endogenous and exogenous processes that generate somatic mutations. But throughout time and throughout evolution, cells have developed uh, DNA repair processes, and these DNA repair processes are alleviating the damage from these exogenous and endogenous processes. And while we are accumulating, while well, DNA is being damaged thousands and tens of thousands of times every single day, only very few of these DNA damages actually become somatic mutations. Nevertheless, the battle is constantly being lost, and cells are slowly accumulating mutations. And again, that's true for every single cell of the body. Now. The, uh, how can we distinguish the different mutational processes that are accumulating mutations in our body? And early work in, uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, um, uh, started looking at the patterns of mutations at TP53. At the time, this was spearheaded by Bert uh, Vogelstein and as well as Monica Holstein. And by, when, uh, when sequencing TP53 mutations in different cancer types with a very strong epidemiological association, People started, uh, 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 people started observing uh, patterns of mutations. So when uh, uh, TP53 was sequenced in 686 skin cancers, and this is UV light associated skin cancers, the predominant type of mutation mutations was C2T mutations at dipyrimidines. And then similarly, when sequencing tobacco associated lung cancers, the predominant pattern of mutation was C2A. Now, these patterns of mutations match very well in vitro data, where DNA was taken, exposed either to UV light or to tobacco carcinogens. And it was speculated in the early 90s that actually by looking at the genetic material of cancer cells, one can say what caused the mutations. So by just looking at, at the tab uh, tobacco associated associated lung cancer, you can actually say that the majority of mutations are generated by smoking cigarettes, and you can also maybe even able to say how much this person has smoked. Now, obviously, sequencing technologies in the 90s were very, very limited. We're talking about traditional Sanger sequencing, but with the advent of next generation sequencing, now we have generated thousands 
uh, even tens of thousands of whole genomes instead of single genes, and we can actually really inter interrogate these patterns of mutations. So let me try to conceptualize that for you. So we can look at the chemotherapy-resistant recurrence of a cancer, and this chemotherapy-resistant recurrence of a cancer is going to have many mutations coming from many different sources. And one can trace the lineage of this chemotherapy-resistant recurrence to the fertilized egg. And as you can see here, mutations are accumulating throughout this lineage. Uh, and where in this schematic depiction, where the cell is blue, it's been during its normal part of the lineage, and where the browner it becomes, the more new plastic it gets. And you can see these little dots, uh, dots with different colors. They're supposed to demonstrate different types of mutations accumulating throughout that lineage. Now, again, from a conceptual uh, standpoint, one can imagine that you have one, a single mutational process that with a specific mutational signature, and I'm using colors to illustrate the point. So this mutational process A can generate six types of colors or six types of mutations, uh, and it predominantly generates black mutations. And this could be something that's constantly active throughout the cell lineage, something that's constantly molding the genome of, of, of this cell. So something such as a molecular clock or a clock-like signature will be a good example. And one can imagine a second mutational process B, and this second mutational process has a different signature, predominantly generating this red and uh, uh, purple mutations. And this could be something much more potent, something that started in adolescence and ended when the cancer was, was, was discovered. So something like tobacco smoking would be a good example. And one can imagine another uh, mutational process C, again, with a distinct mutational signature, and this could be something that's activated with new plastic development. So something like microsatellite instability will be a good example. So in this illustrative example, you can see the lineage of the, uh, of the chemotherapy-resistant recurrence back to the fertilized egg, and we have three mutational processes that are accumulating throughout this lineage. However, when we get this chemotherapy-resistant recurrence, when we get this final cancer genome, and when we sequence it, usually we don't get anything that resembles the, uh, um, uh, the different mutational processes. And the reason it doesn't resemble it is because it's a mixture, it's a jumbo of different mutational processes. This process has been active at different times with different strengths. And the goal is from taking this final cancer genome to be able to actually identify these mutational signatures, and then by using experimental data, to be able to say what causes, what are the processes that cause these signatures. Now, from a mathematical perspective, just having a single cancer genome makes that a poorly defined problem, underpowered problem, but as I said, now we have tens of thousands of cancer genomes, and just because each of these genomes have different signatures from different processes that have been active uh, due to the lifestyle of people or due to the, their genetic background, we can actually use these tens of thousands of cancer genome to deconvolute different mutational signatures. The way we do this deconvolution is we uh, took and modified an approach, a machine learning approach for facial recognition. So uh, the approach is called non-negative matrix factorization. And it's an approach originally developed by uh, Daniel Lee and Sebastian Song at Bell Labs, when Bell Labs used to exist. And this was, uh, this was an uh, this is a screenshot of their Nature uh, paper in 99, uh, and which is cited probably 10,000 times now. And what you see in this paper is you have different faces, and actually these faces can be decomposed into meaningful components. So you can take the face of a person and separate the eyes, the nose, the uh, ears, the mouth, and this could be done by a computer in an unsupervised manner. So we took this algorithm, we substantially modified it, and we make it applicable to cancer genomics data. And we were able to derive a number of mutational signatures. But before I tell you uh, about that, let me just very briefly review the classification of the simplest possible mutations that exist. So there are six possible mutations, single point mutations, C2T, C2A, C2G, T2A, T2C, and T2G. And just to remind you, whether you call a mutation a C2T or a G2A, that's exactly the same thing because you have a CG base pair mutating to a TA base pair. We just use the pyrimidine partner of the Watson and Crick base pair to refer to somatic mutations. Now, just having six possible classes of mutations is a bit too few. So what we did is we just extended that context. We took the base before of the mutation and the base after, which allows us to distinguish this C2T mutation from this C2T mutation from this C2T mutation. So you have six possible uh, mutation classes, but for each one of them, you have four possible bases before, or four possible bases five prime, and four possible bases 
three prime of the mutation, so that gives you 16 possible C2T mutations, and 16 times 6 is 96, so this was a simple 96 mutation classification. Now, using this 96 mutation classification, we have interrogated and published um, more than uh, 12,000 much normal cancer samples. Uh, these include, these are, for these cancers, we have sequenced, uh, the, either, uh, well, both the cancer and the normal, usually blood, was sequenced, and they were compared to derived muta uh, somatic mutations. For about 1,000 of those, we had whole genome sequences. For about 11,000, we had exome sequences. There were about 8 million somatic mutations. We applied the, uh, the non-negative matrix factorization approach. We extracted mutational signatures. And we estimated the contribution of each signature to each one of those catalogs. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about the mutational signatures we have found. They have been published. They have, they're also available on the COSMIC website with a lot of details about their environmental exposure, the lifestyle choices. Instead, I'm going to focus on a specific set of mutational signatures, and these are the clock-like mutational signatures that are operative in normal somatic cells. And we're going to try to look at these clock-like uh, clock mutational signatures through the cracked lenses of cancer genomes. And the reason I call them the cracked lenses of the cancer genomes is that the mutations in the normal lineage when the cancer cell was normal are also imprinted. So we are going to try using mathematical approaches to infer these clock-like mutational signatures and to see how they are acting in different cell types. So let's again go back to a schematic uh, uh, depiction. We have time, we have person A, we have the um, developmental stage of the person, and for most people the developmental stage will be similar, around nine months. We have the normal lineage uh, of the cell in that person, and again that will be dependent on the of the life uh, span of the person, and we have the cancer lineage. And again, that cancer lineage will be person-specific. It will depend uh, when the cancer was detected in regards to when the cancer actually started acting. So if you have this one person, if, you, if there are clock-like mutational signatures, they should be operative throughout the lineage of the cell, so they have been constantly operative. Uh, and th that person will be exposed to different environmental exposures, so for example, the green, uh, arrow here, and they're going to be sporadically active throughout that lineage, and there could be cancer-specific exposures, which will be just in the cancer. So if we get a second person B, again, if they're clock-like processes, they should accumulate throughout the lineage, and then any environmental or lifestyle exposures will be specific for the person and for their lifestyle. And one can imagine a, a very large collection of people, as we have, and uh, again, we have this accumulation of, of clock-like mutations throughout the lineage of the cell, and all the environmental exposures are sporadic and dependent on specific people. So if there are clock-like signatures, they should be proportionate to the actual age of the person because they should be accumulating throughout the lineage of that person. So we looked, uh, so, uh, because, as you can see here, they're proportionate to the lineage, so the mutations should have been uh, as I said, proportional to the age of the person. So we looked at, as I said, 12,000 cancer samples, and we looked whether there are any mutational signatures that behave in this clock-like manner. So what you see here is a summary of stomach cancers, and there's a, probably 100 or so stomach cancer samples. You have the age of diagnosis of the cancer patient, and we have somatic mutations per megabase. And we examined different mutational signatures, and we clearly saw that for at least one of these signatures, there was this accumulation with age. So the older the person was at age of diagnosis, the more mutations we could see from this mutational signature. Uh, and in fact, when we looked at the 30 signatures that we know exist in human cancer, we were able to identify two signatures that were accumulating with age, signature one and signature five. Uh, and again, when we looked across the 40 different cancer types, we saw them in every single cancer type, as one would expect, and we saw them in almost every single cancer patient, as one would expect. So this is signature one. As you can see, signature one is very characteristic. It has C2T mutations, and these C2T mutations um, occur at CPG uh, dinucleotide or NCPG trinucleotides. And one can immediately think of a mutational process underlying this pattern of mutations, and this is the amination of 5-methylcytosine uh, that can cause C2T substitutions at CPG dinucleotides. So you have the 5-methylcytosine, you have the amination, and then after replication, you're going to have a C2T mutation 
at CPG. Now, the slide says spontaneous deamination. Uh, as a number of people have pointed out, this deamination may not be spontaneous. It could be enzymatic, uh, but it could be, but there will be deamination of that 5-methyl cytosine. So let's look at these signature 1 mutations across different cancer types. And as I said, this is signature 1, how, it, how its mutations accumulate in stomach cancer. And again, we can look at the number of cancer types and we can see how its mutation rate accumulates across these cancer types. So in something like colorectum, the number of mutations of signature 1, it generates about 120 single point mutations per year in a diploid genome. And in other tissue types, such as ovary, it's going to generate about 10 mutations per year. In breast, it's going to generate three mutations per year. In melanoma, it's going to generate, or in uh, melanocytes, it's going to generate about two to three mutations per year. So we see this accumulation of mutations in a lot of the different tissue types. Uh, and there's things like myeloma, in which the accumulation is even slower. Um, so we see the rate being different across different tissue types, and we see tissues that divide faster, like stomach, colorectum, uh, being, uh, uh, having much higher rate of mutations. Uh, but we see things such as AML, we see things, tissues such as liver, in which the actual somatic mutations do not cor correlate with age. There is flatness. This and for these tissue types, uh, <clears throat> For these, uh, for these tissue types, we think the actually cracked lens of the cancer genomes are obscuring the ability to see the accumulation because now when we're sequencing normal, normal, single, cells, uh, um, normal single cells of liver, uh, we can actually see the accumulation. Uh, we did a simple test. We said, well, is sing uh, signature one uh, uh, is signature one enriched in active turnover tissues versus low turnover tissues, and indeed it was. So tissues that were dividing faster, stomach, colorectum, had much more mutations uh, of signature one compared to tissues who had low turnover. But in addition to this signature one mutation, in addition to this C2T and CPGs, we were able to find a second mutation of signature, and this is called signature five. And we don't know what causes it. There have been hypotheses that is due to the circadian rhythm of cells or to the, to the, the different fidelity of, repli uh, of replication. But signature five has this rather flat uh, pattern of mutations. And again, when we looked across these different cancer types, in, all, uh, in many of them we find it to associate with, uh, to accumulate uh, with age of diagnosis. So the, big, uh, the significant example is kidney cancer, where 180 mutations are accumulated every year uh, in a diploid genome. And then we saw it in thyroid, we saw it in breast, we saw it in prostate, we saw it in liver. But uh, we didn't see it in colorectum. Uh, we didn't see it in head and neck, we didn't see it in bladder, and we didn't see it in lung. Uh, so when we compare the patterns of mutations of signature one and five, first of all, they have very, very different patterns of mutations. We understand what causes signature one, and we really don't understand what causes signature five. In, in many tissue types, or many cancer types, like metalloblastoma, we see the correlation with age very, very clearly. Um, the other examples are glioblastoma, breast cancers, I'm sorry, uh, low-grade glioma, breast cancers. But in other cancer things, we see very strong correlation for one of the signature, but not the other. So stomach is one example. And conversely, in kidney, uh, uh, in kidney, we see the very strong correlation for signature five, but not such strong correlation for signature one. So we have that difference of accumulation of mutations with age by these two clock-like signatures. Now, again, I would like to point out that from 30 signatures that we have published, these are the only two that associate with age. And now when we even have the refined set of mutational signatures, we have about 60 of them. Again, these are the only two signatures that accumulate with age. So we can very clearly see their accumulation. Uh, and one of the questions is, what is the mutational process underlying signature five? And, uh, uh, and why do signature five mutation uh, rates differ between different cell types, and in all honesty, we don't really know. It is one of the most common mutagenic process in human cancer, and we don't know what causes it. Now, this was the clock-like mutation of signatures in normal cells through the cracked lenses of cancer genomes, but now we can actually look at them without using these cracked lenses. There is sufficient amount of single cell sequencing, there is sufficient amount of other data that allows looking at clock-like mutational signatures in normal somatic cells. 
And the first thing one can do is one can look at mutation of signatures in the novel germline mutations. Just to remind you, the novel germline mutations are the things that are in the child, if you have a trio, a father, a mother, and a child, that the novel germline mutations are the things that are in the child, but are not inherited for neither the mother nor the father. So the speculation is that the, no, uh, the novel germline mutations are generated either in the sperm of the father or in the egg of the mother during the normal lineage of these cells. So when we looked at the normal germline mutations, and we used about um, a thousand trios there, we, we can completely explain the pattern of mutations observed in the novel germline mutations by signature one and five. As a matter of fact, we can see that the accumulation of mutations uh, 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 heavily depends on the age of the father from signature one and five, but not the mother. So we can actually, in this, uh, we can actually say that these signatures recapitulate the de novo germline. And actually, if you look at the overall uh, pattern of, uh, of germline mutations, things like dbSNP or thousand genomes, you'll see that signatures one and five completely explain them. Uh, the question is, is there any other mutation of signatures that do explain the germline in addition to one and five? So if you try to explain the germline mutation of pattern with a single signature, the best signature that explains it with 80% accuracy is signature one, and with 70% accuracy is signature five. And if you try to explain the germline with a combination of two signatures with a 98.6% accuracy, you can explain it by signatures one and five. So this tells you that this mutation of signatures have generated the majority of the human germline, and now we're seeing that they have generated the majority of the mouse and the dog germline. So these are the things that are uh, well, these are the things that in a way are, are, are guiding evolution. So this was the germline, but we can actually look at mutation of signatures in human adult stem cells. And I should say this is a work that, uh, um, that's done uh, by others. This is Hans, Hans Clevers and Ruben van Boxel did uh, this work. And they, uh, they derived tissue specific, uh, um, uh, they, they wanted to look at this uh, tissue specific mutation accumulation. They derived organoids, as Hans always does, and they sequenced these organoids um, at people with different ages. And they found two mutational signatures in this uh, organoid derived stem cells. They found signature one and signature five. And again, you can see here the different rate of accumulation for colon, small intestines, and liver. And you can see that signature one and five are, are accumulating with age with the age of the person, and you can see signature five is very strong with liver, which we saw, uh, the accumulation is very sharp in liver, which we saw through the cracked lenses of cancer, uh, but he couldn't find any uh, accumulation for signature one. And again, we don't really understand why that's the case. So just looking in, in adult stem cells, we can see that. Uh, but more, as more and more data is coming from single cell sequencing, as more and more data is coming from organoid sequencing, again, we're consistently seeing that these two mutational signatures are the ones that are accumulating with age. And lastly, we can use existing data to look at the early stage of the human embryo. And this is a paper that we had about a year ago. And we can actually, using uh, uh, genome sequencing um, uh, of normal blood, we can actually infer the mutations that are, have happened in the first or second division of the actual fertilized egg. And, the, uh, and what we can see again in these first uh, few mutations across a large number of samples is that they're recapitulated almost perfectly. 96.2% of these mutations can be recapitulated by signatures one and five. So we see these two clock-like signatures uh, explaining these first mutations, the mutations that are in this first division of the fertilized egg. And again, if one thinks about somatic mosaicism, this will be the most important somatic mosaic mutations. This will be the ones that uh, will occur, uh, will be found in, in, in many parts of the body, this first and second and third division of the fertilized egg. So in summary, what is the evidence that we, about signature one and five, that they are clock-like, and what is the evidence that, that, that they are generating many of the somatic mosaic mutations. So by using cancer data and through looking through the cracked lens, lenses of cancer of about 12,000 cancer patients, we can see that they are the only mutational signatures that are consistently accumulating with age. By looking in uh, early embryogenesis, and this is an analysis of normal blood from about excuse me, 241 adults, we can see that these first few mutations in these 241 adults are completely explained 
by signature one and five. When we looked at the de novo human germline or the overall human germline, uh, um, we can actually there is a, I think a zero missing here should be a, 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 1009 trios, when we look at the de novo human germline, we can actually see the signature one and five completely recapitulate that de novo, germ, uh, de novo germline, and also they com uh, uh, completely recapitulate the complete human germline. Uh, and then when we look at, or rather when others look in adult stem cells, uh, this independent analysis of 45 organoids from 19 donors, again, the mutations that are accumulating in these adult stem cells are coming from this uh, are coming from these mutational signatures. Now, as I said before, the mutational process underlying signature one is known, or at least we understand its molecular mechanisms. Uh, conversely, uh, 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 the mutational mechanisms underlying signature five are unknown. We don't know what causes this mutational signature. It's important for human evolution. It's very important for human cancer, but we just don't know what is the molecular underlying, but we see it very, very consistently. So overall, in summary, we can say clock, uh, signature one and five are clock-like. They accumulate in normal cells with age. Um, they generate the majority of endogenous mosaic somatic mutations, as we can see that from the early embryology work. Uh, uh, and we can actually start estimating the in vivo somatic rates of different tissue types. Now, I need to go to uh, the acknowledgments. This was a work that I've been very much doing with Mike Stratton and the Sanger. Uh, a lot of very productive collaborations since I started in, at uh, UCSD, as well as there is a variety of signatures collaborator throughout the world, world, which we have been working on this and other aspects of mutational signatures and other aspects of carcinogenesis. Uh, a lot of the work that I do is funded by a Grand Challenge Award by uh, Cancer Research UK, and special thanks to them. And then thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Ludmilla. We have some time for a few questions. Uh, I'll start with the first. Uh, do you ever see any strong outliers where there are people that aren't accumulating these mutations over time? And you know, are you trying to investigate, you know, what can prevent, you know, the accumulation of mutations in these people? So we have seen the other type of outliers. We have seen outliers where these mutations have accumulated much faster, and we have seen people who are deficient in certain repair pathways, and we can see that these mutations are accumulating faster in their tissue types. We, uh, there is a, a quite a lot of normal somatic data that's being accumulated at the, no in the moment, and we don't know whether it will be the other outliers, people who accumulate mutations slower. There should be, uh, but we just haven't seen that yet. Do you see the same clocks in other uh, organisms, not just humans, but mouse models or even other you know, mm. other species? Yeah. So, so very much we see that. Uh, so we see that in mouse models. Uh, we see that. Uh, so that's absolutely the same analysis that I showed for human cancer and has been done for mice, and we see exactly the same thing. We see that they are accumulating in mice. Uh, we have done it in Tasmanian devils and in dogs, and we see exactly the same thing. I don't know how big this goes evolutionary, whether that will be the case in Drosophila or C. elegans, but at least for, for the organisms we have looked, we see that they are, uh, these are the normal uh, somatic mutational process. Oh, over here. Very oh, interesting. Sorry. Very interesting. Uh, would you predict um, that the clocks are going to be different in a quiescent stem cell, like the hematopoietic stem cell, or a leukemia stem cell, versus, say, the intestinal? I, I, I would predict so, and there's some data being generated in the moment, but obviously one doesn't know. But yes, I think that would make sense to me. And do you think it's going to be signature one? And or five? I don't know, because the, uh, I, 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 I think signature one. Yeah, I don't know. I really think we need to look at the data because they have surprised me a number of times. I was really surprised by what you said about the somatic mutations arising um, more in the sperm of the man once he gets older, but not in the egg of the woman. Mm. While I, I like, we've always heard that when a woman gets older, the mutations arise, but I've never heard that about a man before. I think the, the sperm of the man is, uh, uh, well, the, egg of the, the women's eggs do not divide. You know, they're obviously, the majority of them are formed while uh, well, actually the woman is mostly an embryo, where the sperm of the man constantly divides. 
And the, just by the, this division, uh, we, we see the accumulation of mutations in the sperm. So if we look, and especially if children from older parents, we will see that they have much more than old, older fathers, I should say. We see that they have much more than novel mutations, which is not the which is not the case for children from older mothers. Having said that, also we cannot have we don't have mothers at 70 or 60, so we we you know the X supply disappears. So uh, as of right now, we see very strong correlation with the age of the, the father, but not the one of the mother. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, I have a question about your signature five. It's possible since the signature one is, signature five recapitulates signature one and adds a little more, but it's a very low level signal. Have you mapped your instances of the signature five to each genome and then done a distance constraint analysis of how far away the T to C mutations are from your C to T? Because it could yeah. be a dependent subset that are going T to C of the C to T. You know, C to T we know happens, that's the dominant change in all genomes, and it would be interesting to know if, in fact, some of those are driving the secondary mm. change, which is, in fact, your signature five, and that would become the interesting signature. So we have, we have tried to look at the distance between the different mutations generated by, different, by, the, by these two signatures as, as, well, as well as by other signatures. Um, we don't see what you, what, what you said. Um, um, we see, as far as we can say, that they are independent. Obviously, it's hard to, to completely show that. Uh, but also, we have very clear examples where you know, normal liver tissue, where we sequence it, and essentially, we almost don't see in that normal tissue, uh, normal single cell livers, we almost don't see the accumulations of C2T CPGs. There are some, but they're very, very little. Whereas, we see this very strong pattern in hundreds uh, and thousands of mutations, rather, from signature five. And as far as we can say, they are not, there is no distance or relation with C2T CCPGs or with any other feature of the genome that we know of. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. I, I was wondering if you've looked at uh, the signatures in, in intestinal stem cells from different parts of the intestine, which are, for instance, small bowel cancer is incredibly mm. uncommon versus mm. large bowel, and what you see there, if, if you've done that. Yeah, so that question is extremely interesting. That data is being generated at the moment, so it's, 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 we're, we're trying to look at that. Uh, so I don't know the answer, but you're right. I mean, why is it so rare? Uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's, is it the mutations, or is it something else specific for, uh, yeah, for the small bowel? So I, we're generating this data at the moment. Thank you so much.